Okay, welcome back to Conformal Invariance. Um, let me uh, remind everyone that uh, I really appreciate it if you can um, share your video, if at all uh, feasible. Hi, Richard. <laughs> and um, uh, so, uh, small administrative thing, I have posted the new homework to the uh, webpage. So just a reminder, so the homework, is now posted, but it's not due, it's now posted, and it's not due uh, in, in seven days, it's due in nine days on Thursday. And I'm putting in the extra gap because we have a wellness day this Thursday. In other words, our next class uh, this Thursday will not meet for lecture uh, because it is a university wellness day. It's a little little piece of spring break for you. Maybe it will be nice out. Um, and uh, but please go ahead and start looking at the posted homework, and uh, you'll have plenty of opportunities to come to um, my office hours, Carl's office hours, and section, and so on um, to get uh, hints on the homework. Um, what else? We have an alarmingly small number of classes left, uh, I think four in total, including today, but I do hope to um, cover as the final topics. Um, there's three in instances of the continuum limit idea that we will explore. The first one we're in the middle of now is discrete harmonic functions becoming smooth harmonic functions in the limit. Uh, the second one, which I have to start today, is the idea of random walks converging to Brownian motion. Which provides a tool to work directly with, the, um, with random processes in discussing harmonic functions without having to go to a lattice. And then finally, I hope to say some things about uh, percolation. And it, so in, in preparation for these last two topics, let me emphasize for Brownian motion, there's some nice reading, uh, which is uh, which is the chapter two of Dinkin and Yuskovich. This is, um, of course, available online, it's linked via the syllabus, and it's um, it's posted to the homework page. And then for percolation, I, there's two uh, very good references. One is Swernov's papers. He has two short papers. One is very short and one is called the long version, which is also short. Um, and uh, these are also linked in the syllabus. And then there's the book by uh, Bolabash and Reardon. Pardon me if I don't remember where the diacritical marks, marks go. And especially here, chapters three and seven cover the material we want to do on uh, the conformal invariance of percolation limits, or at least the crossing probabilities. Okay, so, um, so today I'm going to wrap up the um, convergence of discrete harmonic functions to smooth ones and hopefully start on Brownian, uh, Brownian motion. So any questions before we get uh, started? Okay, so I just wanna make a remark about the main um, technical point in the discussion of um, discrete limits of uh, harmonic functions. Um, so remember the, the main technical estimate that was required was something like this. You have the, you're starting a random walk at the point I in the upper half plane, and you have a large box where the side lengths of the box are. And actually it's part of a square, it's two right across the top. And the claim was that 
the probability that a random walk starting at I hits the one of the three sides of the box before it reaches the real axis is very small. So the probability that Xi hits uh, uh, the boundary of the box before hitting the real axis, in other words, if it hits this, these three edges before it hits this edge, is big O one over n. And I want to remind you uh, about how we did this um, because it illustrates a, a, a very useful principle that we will pursue uh, on the homework. So one thing you could do is forget about the sides of the box and just say, I have a random walk starting at I, and I want to know what's the probability it hits the top of the box before it hits the bottom. And if you like, that is a question of what is the harmonic measure of the top, which I'll call T, versus the bottom, which is the real axis. So we can look at the harmonic measure as seen from I through this strip S of the top of the box. And how do you compute the harmonic measure? You find a harmonic function uh, let's call it f, which is equal to one on the top of the box, and it's equal to zero on the bottom. And, uh, and then the value of f and i is the probability that a random walk hits t when it exits the strip s. So if that's the probability we're interested in. It's actually the harmonic measure of the top of the box, or in fact, that's an upper bound for the probability of hitting the top of this box. Um, now, how do you, what is such an f? Well, there's an obvious f. You can just take f of z to be y, except the height here is n, so you take y divided by n. So that is, in fact, a harmonic function. It vanishes here, it's one here. And what's its value in i? The y coordinate of i is one, and so it's one over n. So that's the easy part, is, is dealing with paths that exit through the top of the box. Now, there's also the possibility that the path exits through the right edge or the left edge. And for that, we want to solve the analogous harmonic uh, measure problem. So now we have the left edge of the box in the real axis. And we'd like to know what is the harmonic measure of i through this quadrant q of the left edge of the box. So we want a harmonic function that's zero here and that's one here. Well, there is a harmonic function that's very nice that does that. It's constant on the rays passing through this point here, which I guess is minus n. So it's the argument of z plus n. Let's call that f of z. So that vanishes on the real axis because the argument of these points as seen from minus n is zero, the angle is zero, and then it goes up to pi over two on L, so we should divide by, uh, by pi over two. And then it's equal to one on L, and it's harmonic because it's the real part of, um, it's the imaginary part rather of the logarithm of z plus n. And so that looks really good too, and then f of i is the argument of, um, of, uh, of i plus n, which is just this angle here. And that angle is obviously a, roughly one over n. So this is big O of one over n. And then you're done. So that's a great proof of the, of the, of the uh, estimate. And there's only one minor problem that I've swept under the rug, which is the following. If you look at the function y, y is harmonic as an ordinary complex analytic function, function on the complex plane, it's a smooth harmonic function. So this is smooth harmonic, but it's also discrete harmonic. In fact, any linear function is both smooth and discretely harmonic. Now the argument, here is smooth, a smooth harmonic function. 
But think about what has to happen for this to be discreetly harmonic. It has to have the property that the angle of a point up here should be the average of the angles of these four points, as seen from this point down here. And that's close to being true, and it gets closer as the lattice gets finer, but it's not literally discreetly harmonic. Not discreetly. So that's one of the reasons why we gave the proof in a, in a very different way. Uh, another reason was to emphasize the basic facts about random walks in one dimension before we analyze them in two. But there is a way to make this statement work here. And it has to do with the fact that it doesn't matter so much that whether or not this function is harmonic on the lattice, what matters is whether or not it's super harmonic. And if it's super harmonic, then it can be used to still give a bound, an upper bound on harmonic measure, uh, which is what we want. And so uh, in the upcoming homework, um, you'll fill in the details to that way of carrying out the argument. Okay, so that brings us back to the discussion of discrete harmonic functions in the, in the continuum setting. So let me, uh, just as a little prelimin preliminary, talk about calculus in the discrete setting. Discrete calculus. So often our setting is this, we have a region containing the complex numbers, and then we approximate it by a grid. So we take the intersection with the Gaussian integer scaled by h, where h is greater than zero, and typically should be thought of as being small. Okay, so we have many discrete grid points filling out, filling out our region. And then instead of considering functions on our region, we consider discrete functions on this lattice. So we consider f mapping omega h into the real numbers. And um, it's useful to be able in this setting to talk about derivatives and even harmonic functions as we already have. Uh, before the lattice was rescaled. So let me just say precisely how this is done. So first, the x derivative of f is by definition f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So you take two adjacent lattice points and you compare them according to, uh, you compare the change in f divided by the, the physical separation of the points in this rescaled lattice. Now, the, you might have a contrarian who says, why did you choose to go plus h? Why don't you go minus h? There's really no reason not to say the derivative is f of x minus f of x minus h over h. So actually, it's not a bad idea to have both of these kinds of derivatives available. And indeed, if we want to discuss the Laplacian of f, and get back to our formula, which involves averaging over neighbors, we want to be able to move, look at neighbors to the left as well as to the right, neighbors above and neighbors below. So we define the Laplacian of F, well, let me just call it the Laplacian, to be, um, to be uh, dx, dx minus plus dy, dy minus. And um, this ends up uh, uh, <clears throat> being, if I'm not mistaken, um, let's see. So I think I have the factor of four right, but I'm not quite positive. Let me write it down. So it's one over four h squared times. Um, uh, f of x plus h um, plus f of x minus h plus f of x plus i h plus f of x minus i h. And then from the whole thing, we subtract off minus 4 f of x. I think I have the 4 right, but I'm not quite positive. Uh, in any case, what we see here is the discrete Laplacian. We take the average value of the neighbors of f uh, versus the value of f itself. 
But, but a new term enters, which is that there's an H squared in front of this. And that's because there's an H in the derivative. So it's natural when working on not the unit grid, but the grid scale by H to introduce this additional factor into the Laplacian. And so then AF should be thought of as the M log of one, one, um, one half the Laplacian of F. And in fact, AF equals one half the Laplacian of F if F is a quadratic function in uh, X and Y. And we'll we'll <coughs> we'll need that uh, that fact shortly. Okay, so now uh, we come to the the first statement about harmonic functions, which is compactness. Of course, we now want by harmonic we mean that AF equals zero on this grid uh, omega h. And then the idea of continuum limits is we take a sequence hn tending to zero and we look at harmonic functions uh, fn from omega n into uh, let's say minus one one at least would be harmonic and uniformly bounded uh, omega is fixed but we let this this grid get smaller and smaller so this is shorthand for omega hn and the first theorem is that we can extract limits of these things and and uh, that goes back to our main estimate and if by exploiting that theorem correctly we'll get that in fact all of these discrete functions become more and more like smooth harmonic functions as the size of the mesh goes to zero so let's state that final result so for any fn from omega n to r harmonic, discrete harmonic, of course. Um, there exists a smooth from omega to r, uh, also harmonic. Now, in the smooth sense, uh, sorry, this should have been to minus one one, so they're uniformly bounded, uh, such that Fn tends to F uniformly on compact sets. So one way to make this precise is you fix a compact set K, which you should usually think of as being the closure of a large open set inside of omega, and then you take the soup over as uh, uh, z in omega n intersect k those will be the lattice points that lie inside of k and then there you take the difference between f of z and capital f of z and this quantity uh, goes to zero uh, for all okay okay so the are you what conditions are you um supposing about the f, little f sub n like are they all have the same boundary values or something like why yeah. are we saying like no. so so this is this beautiful fact that let me remind you what happens in complex analysis if you take the holomorphic functions on the disk that are bounded by one they form a compact set any sequence has a uniformly converging subsequence Oh, so we're saying subsequence. Oh, uh, maybe I missed that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Such, such that I, I dropped that off. Along a, a subsequence. Thank you very much. Right. So this is a compactness result. It says that the set of bounded harmonic functions in the discrete setting is compact, and as the mesh goes to zero, all of their limits are harmonic. Other questions? Okay, so. The main point is <clears throat> that our technical estimate implies that, uh, that if we take the x derivative of f uh, at z, and z is in a compact set k, 
um, then this x derivative is less than or equal to a constant that depends on this compact set for all n. And that is just a rescale version of the statement that we were just discussing. If you have f bounded by one on the original lattice in a square of size n, then, um, then it moves a distance at most one over n when you go to adjacent lattice points. Well, but you see the value of h is about the same as one over n. And so when you divide through, by one over n, you get this x derivative with the h in the bottom. So this is really just a restatement of, of what that theorem said. And the way you prove it is when you want to consider two nearby lattice points, you put them inside of a big lattice square. And the size you can make the square is like the distance from uh, the bound of, from k to the boundary of uh, your region. So that's some constant that's fixed. Uh, over all of k, and then the, then the number of dots, the, the side length of the square is roughly one over h. In fact, it's this radius times one over h. Um, so that gives this, this uniform bounds on the derivatives, and of course also for the y derivative, just by rotating the lattice. Okay, so, so for the proof, we, we use these estimates to, 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 to show that Fn is uniformly continuous on this set K. So by, let me just call this technical estimate star and the arzela Ascoli theorem, uh, we get Fn tending to F continuous because the functions of interest have a uniform modulus of continuity. Now you might quibble that they that they are not defined on the whole space. As I mentioned, there are several ways to finesse that. One would be to extend them to piecewise linear functions using a triangulation. In any case, it follows easily from this kind of control that there exists a continuous limit. But now comes comes the great the great fact, which is that since these, these functions are bounded by C of K, these functions here were bounded by one. But DX FN is also a discrete harmonic for each N because A DX equals DX A. These are all just linear differential operators, so they commute with one another. And so DX N is harmonic and it's less than or equal to this constant C of K. So we can apply the theorem again to these new functions dx f f. And, and so we conclude that their derivatives are also bounded. So dx x, f n, dx y, f n, and dy y, f n uh, are all bounded this time times another constant, depending on k. And in particular, we can pass to a further subsequence such that dx fn tends to g. And now here's the main point. This g is continuous. Remember, we got this g using the fact that the derivatives of dx fn were also bounded. So it's continuous for exactly the same reason f was continuous. But now let's think about what it means to have a discrete function whose derivative is almost continuous. It means that if you pick a point P, then G at P is approximately some constant S. And that means that the differences, the values of DX of FN look like S, which means that as you move from one lattice point to another, the graph of F almost follows a straight line of slope S. But that implies that remember these functions are converging in the limit to our function F. And so in fact, dx at this function G is nothing more than the derivative of F with respect to X. So what we conclude is that F is differentiable 
and uh, the, the combinatorial derivatives converge to the derivative of f. And by the same token, uh, so similarly, y f and converges to the f to y, and this is continuous. Now there's a little point I want you to draw attention to here. It's much easier for us to take the derivatives in the x direction and the derivative in the y direction than the derivative in some random direction. The lattice works in our favor to allow us to define these combinatorial derivatives. They're defined using the generators of the lattice. So we didn't prove that f was differentiable yet. What we proved is that its x derivative exists and its y derivative exists. But it's a famous fallacy in calculus that a function whose partial derivatives exists has a total differential. It might not, in fact, be a differentiable function. However, it's also a basic theorem that if the partial derivatives are continuous, as they are in this case, then in fact the function is C1. It has a, uh, a, a total differential. It's approximated by a linear map of two variables, not just having partials existing in each. So because both of these are continuous, this implies F itself is C1. And now we just bootstrap the procedure, continue again with each of these guys that continuous to be harmonic. So in fact, F is C infinity. That was fast. And then by, by the same token, uh, the fact the same argument that shows this derivative converges to the derivative of f with respect to x shows that a of fn converges to one half the velocity of f. But these were zero all along, and this implies f is our mind. Okay. So that's the that's the sketch of the proof of uh, the passage from discrete to continuous harmonic functions. And uh, what I want to emphasize is just it all has to do with this, it all boils down to this kind of technical estimate. Now, by the way, as I mentioned, the way this technical estimate worked was that we could draw a square here and the size of the square was controlled by the distance to the boundary. So we can actually say what this constant is we could say it's less than or equal to big O of one over the distance from Z to the boundary of omega. Because that was the size of the square we could draw. Well, now think about this. Suppose F was harmonic, not on some sub lattice, but on the entire Z sub I. So suppose we had f from z sub i to r to minus one one, a bounded harmonic function on the whole lattice. In other words, suppose we could take omega equal to c. Then what would happen to this estimate for the combinatorial derivative? It would be one over the distance to the boundary. The distance to the boundary is infinite. And so that would prove that this function is constant. So our combinatorial lemma, our technical estimate, gives another proof that bounded harmonic functions on the whole Z2 lattice are necessarily constant functions. Okay, so that shows that this technical estimate actually has quite a bit of power uh, hidden in it. Since our, our, our proof of that fact was kind of a little bit subtle. So the main thing to know about, about these kinds of arguments is um, that they're easy once you get, once a, a obvious fact is verified. And the obvious fact that's verified is one that we're guided to by what happens in the uh, continuous setting. Uh, but the proof of this obvious fact may be very subtle. The proof that we gave of this involved random walks and the reflection principle, estimates on first hitting times, and even this other proof involves superharmonic functions. Okay. So now, um, just to conclude this, we'd like to 
um, carry out a procedure analogous to what Henry was alluding to. Namely, we'd like to use random walks or discrete harmonic functions to solve the Dirichlet problem. So, um, so solving the Dirichlet problem via discrete approximation. And as I mentioned, this is done all the time in uh, numerical analysis. I was doing this for a summer job back in the 1970s. Oh my God, we're programming in Fortran. <laughs> so this has been around for a long time. Um, so I'm not gonna prove the strongest version here. I'm gonna prove a version uh, that cheats a little bit. Um, it uses the theory that we have already about um, this continuous, uh, the smooth Dirichlet problem to get conclusions about what happens when you pass to the discrete case. But I don't view this as really uh, unfair because um, in fact, that's how the discrete version really arose. Everyone knew about harmonic functions from the time of Riemann and much earlier. And only, only in the modern age did people wonder about discretizing them and using that to do calculations numerically. Okay, so the setting I'm gonna work with is going to be smooth. And I'm gonna already know the solution to the Dirichlet problem. Uh, so I'm going to uh, put myself in this setting. So I want omega bar to be a smoothly bounded region in C, compact. It might have holes in it. And uh, as usual, I'm going to also have a grid um, that I'm going to lay down with a mesh at HN. So we have the sequence of HN going to zero, as usual. And, um, and now I want to have on this, I want F to be smooth on a neighborhood of the boundary of omega. And the Laplacian F should equal zero in omega. So in other words, just to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to solve the Dirichlet problem on omega for smooth boundary data. And what does it mean to have smooth boundary data? It means that first the boundary has to be smooth, and then second the function, the boundary function has to be smooth on the boundary. Okay, so now we take our discrete approximations to uh, this problem. So from F restricted to the boundary of omega, we construct Fn from omega n to R, um, uh, which are discrete harmonic. And I want that Fn of z approximately equals F of z on the boundary of omega n, the discrete boundary of omega n. Uh, now, what does that mean? It means that, of course, there's, well, there's a problem, which is with this smooth boundary, it's very unlikely the boundary goes through in lattice points. The lattice points can only approximate the boundary. But certainly, if you have a, a point that's, that's, um, that's inside the region, but the, the, within the ball uh, radius 2h around this point, there is some lattice point. And so if you're right on the boundary, there's some lattice point uh, uh, that's reasonably close. And so what I really want to require here is that the absolute value of f and of z uh, minus capital F of Z um, is, uh, is, um, is uh, well, um, 
minus uh, capital F of Y is, uh, sorry, W. I love that this is um, big O of H, where, um, where uh, if the distance, the absolute value of Z minus W is less than or equal to H, and Z is in the boundary of omega N, and W is in the boundary of omega. So in other words, what I want you to do is go around the edge of your grid, and for each point on the grid, find a nearby point on the boundary, and then use that to specify the value of this discrete harmonic function on the boundary of omega. Then turn your linear algebra crank or use random walks, et cetera, to extend that to a discrete harmonic function. Now, since F is defined on a compact region, we might as well assume that F goes to the interval from minus one to one. It can be assumed to be a bounded function. This is just for security. <laughs> and so similarly, since these guys are close to F on the boundary by the maximum principle, they also are uniformly bounded. Okay, so then the theorem is that uh, Fn of Z tends to F of Z uniformly in omega. In other words, the soup over omega n of the absolute value of fn of z minus f of z goes to zero. And in fact, it goes to zero at a predictable rate. It's big O of hn, which is our mesh size. So notice how much stronger this is than our previous result. We're not talking about uniform convergence on compact sets. We're actually getting uniform convergence throughout our discretized region. And not only that, but we're getting it with a bound and the bound is basically as good as it could possibly be. It's the size of the mesh. Now, why is this as good as it could possibly be? Well, when you take a, a mesh point, the distance from that mesh point to a boundary point might be as much as H apart. And so this kind of discrepancy of O of H is already introduced when you discretize the boundary. Uh, this should have been HN. So this is really, this is really quite strong uh, conclusion. And the, the theorem could be formulated and proved for more general domains, but I want to prove this version first to show how robust this method is in calculating um, these kinds of harmonic functions. Like you might have a transcendental function that's given by maybe F is the real part of, a, of E to the Z or, or some the Weierstrass P function. You can fall, find the values of F on the interior re of this region if you know its boundary values um, because of the smoothness hypothesis. Okay, so, so now for the proof. The proof uses a really great idea that we just encountered at the beginning of class. So the idea is use our nice harmonic function f restricted to omega n as an approximation to fn. And this guy acts as, after all, is harmonic, and it has the right boundary value. So doesn't, why doesn't that already solve the problem? Why doesn't it prove that, F, that Fn is just equal to F? <laughs> well, the problem is that what we have is that the Laplacian of F is zero. But that does not imply that A of F is equal to zero when we restrict it to the lattice. Again, A of F requires sampling F at these points that are distant H apart. However, by Taylor's theorem, We can write f of z, f of z as equal to a constant plus a linear term plus a quadratic term plus a term that, let's say, near z is equal to zero, just as for concreteness, a term that's bounded by big O of z cubed. And to say the Laplacian of f is zero is to say exactly that this quadratic term plus linear term plus constant, that they are annihilated by the Laplacian. But 
The combinatorial Laplacian also annihilates linear and quadratic functions. So when we apply A to F, we might as well throw away these terms. And then we're left with a function that's growing like Z cubed near the origin. Now, that means if we sample it at points that are H apart, the values change by something like H cubed. And A of F has a one over H squared in its definition. And so what we conclude is that A of F restricted to the lattice omega N is big O of H, big O of H N. It's not quite harmonic. Too bad. How can we fix this? Well, remember that if we have a harmonic function, so here's fn, afn is zero, it's harmonic. And then if we had another function, let's call this gn, that was say super harmonic, And let me call this capital GM. And had the same boundary values, then it would have to lie above the harmonic function. And if we could make another function GN that was subharmonic and also lay below FN on the boundary, then uh, that would give a lower bound for FN. So if we can sandwich F between a subharmonic function and a superharmonic function, and these two things both converge to capital F, then Fn will have to converge to capital F. So let's try to find the subharmonic and superharmonic functions. So I'm gonna just define them. So let Gn of z equal F of z plus a constant times the absolute value of z squared, this will depend on n, minus another constant bn. Now, what is the Laplacian? So let me just remind you that gn is subharmonic, discrete subharmonic, if and only if a of gn is greater than or equal to zero. And what is A of the absolute value of C squared? Well, it's one half the Laplacian of X squared plus Y squared, which is uh, four, so this is equal to two. So this quantity here, Cn squared, has constant Laplacian. F itself has a Laplacian that's just fluctuating around zero with size hn. So if I push it up, push its Laplacian up by a constant that's on the order of hn, I can force this not to be of indefinite sign, but to be positive. So we can choose an bounded in size by hn. So uh, this holds. So that gn becomes uh, super harmonic. Okay, so this is a great trick. A function whose Laplacian is small can be turned into a subharmonic function by just adjusting it by a small function with a definitely positive Laplacian. Now, one of the problems is that we've changed the boundary values of F when we do that. Um, so we also would like to, to, to have that GM lies below F and FN on the boundary. So we want also that gn of z is less than or equal to fn of z on the boundary of omega n. Um, so how can we arrange that? Well, remember fn of z is equal to some, is equal to uh, f of z plus something that's on the order again, of little hn. And since the region is bounded and an is on the order of hn, this term also is on the order of h. So when you put these two things together, you're within the value of fn of z to an error that's comparable to your mass size. 
And so we want to be below our function. So we're close to it, but maybe above or below. We just push it down using en. So this can be achieved with a bn equal big O of h. And so what we find is that we have the soup norm of gn minus f over omega n is a big O of hn. And we have then gn is less than or equal to fn by the maximum principle for subharmonic functions. And in exactly the same way, we can, we can use a minus a n prime times the n plus b n prime, both of these being positive, to construct a, a function g n that bounds f from above. And then both of these are converging to f. In fact, the difference of both of these from f is big O of h n. And since f n is between these two bounds, its error term is also uh, big O big chip. So the conclusion is that the soup over omega n of f n minus f is also big O big chip. And that's the end of the proof of the theorem. Okay. So the upshot is that Discrete harmonic functions on a lattice provide a very clear connection between random walks and harmonic functions. On the other hand, as the grid gets finer and finer, discrete harmonic functions converge to continuous ones. And that allows one to use random walk techniques when studying smooth harmonic functions. However, it's still a little bit awkward because we're doing random walks on a lattice and we want to study, let's say, smooth harmonic functions in C. So it's a bit awkward to have to go back to the lattice, use discrete harmonic functions, and then pass to the limit. What we really like to do is have a substitute for the random walk that works in the complex plane. And that is the next uh, topic about discrete limits, continual limits, which is Brownian motion. Okay, so this is this is called um, I think continuum limit two in the notes. So please take a look at this chapter. Okay, so so first it's compulsory to tell. Uh, some sort of anecdote about uh, about microscopes, pollen, and brown. So I have no idea if this is true or not. I might this might be a folk tale, but the story is that that um, Brown was examining grains of pollen suspended in uh, water under a microscope, and of course pollen is amazing because it's. Um, it's it's used it, it allows plants to reproduce it carries life within it and yet pollen seems to be inert it doesn't it doesn't walk around it doesn't seem to have any agency it doesn't metabolize um well when brown looked at them under the microscope he could actually see they were moving and so then he realized that there was a little life force a creature or something inside of a pollen grain um <laughs> But you have to look at it at very high magnification, and uh, the, the pollen grain didn't seem to be trying to get anywhere. It was just kind of jiggling around. <laughs> and eventually, uh, the explanation was given and formulated in part by Einstein that what's actually happening is the, uh, the pollen grain is moving randomly, not due to anything happening inside the, the grain of pollen, but because it's buffeted it by the uh, 
thermal energy of the surrounding molecules. And it's small enough that sometimes more molecules hit with more velocity on one side than the other side, causing it to jiggle back and forth, but in a completely isotropic and unorganized uh, way. And so Brownian motion can be thought of as a model for this continuous motion of a, of a particle in, in a sort of isotropic setting. But for us, the idea is to take random walks on HN, C a join I, let's say, or CD, and get these to converge to some process called D of T on RD. And so I remember our random walks were described by these HN, XNs with X0 equals zero. <clears throat> and maybe I should say on, on ZD, let's not even rescale yet. And then by rescaling, we want to, in the limit, produce this uh, random walk. Now we could pretend we don't know anything but random walks and try to produce, just take the limit and derive what its properties are, show it's unique, et cetera. But as with harmonic functions, I think it's more economical and you gain greater insight by constructing Brownian motion directly using the fact that we know how to do analysis and measure theory and then showing that it that random walks converge to it. So, so what is Brownian motion? So Brownian motion in the simplest case will be a map from the real numbers which we regard as time into the real numbers, which we regard as space. It's a particle moving randomly on the real axis. And this map will be uh, determined uh, by a probability measure. Um, let me call it uh, new on the continuous functions on R. So this is a Bonnock space. It has, uh, it, or if you like, it's a it's a fresh A space. Anyway, it has a topology. It has Borel sets, and then we can talk about measurable functions on the continuous functions on R. Um, so in particular, Brownian motion, almost every point that, for, that we pick will give a continuous function B of T, and it will satisfy certain axioms. So when I say that this following axioms hold, uh, it means that for almost every B of t chosen at random with respect to mu, the following properties of B of t hold. So first, of course, B of zero should be equal to zero. And this is redundant, but I'm going to emphasize this because it's really the main point of the construction of Brownian motion is that B of t is continuous. Okay, now the next axiom is meant to capture the idea that a random walk uh, is a Markov process. That is, the next step is in no way influenced by the previous steps. So the increments are given by independent random variables. So here we say that if, if we have T1 less than T2 less than Tn for any finite sequence of numbers, real numbers, uh, the increments, which are the amount by which Brownian motion changes over these disjoint time intervals, these are independent random variables. So remember, each one of these, it gives a function on this measure space. The space of continuous functions with this measure new, and we can discuss when we have uh, real value functions on a measure space whether or not they're independent. Um, okay, so we want this independence, and now we also want to try to decide um, how fast Brownian motion should move. And so we're going to say more about what these increments look like. And so the next statement is that for all. Uh, uh, t uh, less than s, well, let's say for all t greater than zero, 
And for all s, b of s plus t minus b of s, which is the, a time t increment, has mean zero and variance uh, t. Now, why is this? Why is this the right thing to expect? Well, remember that if you have independent random variables x and y, if these are independents, then the variance of x plus y is the variance of x plus the variance of y. They're like orthogonal vectors in a Hilbert space, so this their length squared add. And so, if we take the, this increment and break it up into many small increments, the uh, the variance of this guy should be the sum of the increments of the small thing. And that's consistent with the increments growing linearly in time t. And uh, finally, this is kind of a little bit of unnecessary nicing on the cake, but it's also worthwhile saying because it just clarifies the picture very greatly, which is that, in fact, each increment is a Gaussian random variable. Now remember, a Gaussian random variable has a distribution that's uniquely determined by its mean and its variance. So in fact, once we've said that the increment is Gaussian, we know exactly what the increment is. Um, so let me amplify five a bit. So five implies that dt is distributed on R. You fix a time, you take a Brownian path, evaluate it at that time, it gives you a random point on the real numbers according to the density, one over the square root of two pi t times e to the minus um, x squared over 2t. Uh, so the, the standard deviation of this is given by the square root of t. Okay, so at time t, uh, the Brownian path has moved a distance roughly the square root of t, just as a random walk after n steps moves a distance roughly square root of n. And uh, since I'm almost at the bottom of the board, let me just state the main theorem. There exists a unique new with these properties. Okay, so, so how, does, how does Brownian motion actually behave? Well, it behaves like a rescaled version of the random walk, um, but you have to rescale at different rates in space and time uh, uh, because of the fact that a random walk only moves distance square root of n in time n. So you need to blow up the space coordinate faster than you do the time coordinate. So the way a Brownian path looks, if we go from time zero to one, is roughly like this. Okay, this is a typical graph of B of T, and I have a computer version I can show you in a moment. But the main thing is to just to notice that after you've gone only time T, then the, the maximum of the function you've seen so far is probably on the order of square root of T. Whereas if this were a linear function, it would be on the order of T. So it makes very large jumps over small time. So B of T is in fact not differentiable. In fact, it's nowhere differentiable with probability one, although that requires a little bit of work to see, but this indicates that with probability one, it's nowhere, it's not differentiable at the origin. Um, uh, on the other hand, it is continuous. 
And so you might wonder, how continuous is it? And this, since this uh, distribution applies just as well to these increments, we expect the difference between V of S and V of S plus D, we expect that this to be often on the order of square root of T, not on the order of T. So it's non-linear looking near every point, but still there's a, there's a modulus of continuity here. On the other hand, it's Gaussian distributed, and so it has a definite probability of being more than square root of t. And what we can assert, and this is the main method we will use to prove when we construct Brownian motion that it is actually condition, continuous, is that um, B on 0, 1 is, this always means with probability 1, Helder continuous. of exponent slightly less than a half. And that means that if you take two points S and T and the interval from zero to one, then the absolute value of B of S minus B of T is less than or equal to a constant that depends on that epsilon times S minus T to the one half minus epsilon, which is bigger than the square root. Uh, since we're looking at taking square roots of small numbers, smaller power, even smaller powers make them bigger. Um, it's also true that Brownian motion almost has uh, one derivative in, um, in L2, uh, but not quite. Um, okay, so that's great that we supposedly have this thing, but how do you construct it? So if we were if we were Borbach key, what we would do is we would write down the axioms, and then we prove everything we want to ever prove about Brownian motions from the axioms, and then the construction would be left as an exercise. Um, because there's many constructions, and none of them is necessarily more canonical than any other. We just have to show something exists that satisfies these axioms. But that's not the approach that we are going to take. So I will give you at least uh, one construction of Brownian motion in a fair amount of detail. Um, but there are three natural constructions, at least three natural constructions. So the first construction is write B of T as a limit of random walks. Now, let's think about how we would want to do this. Um, so we start out with X of N, a random walk on Z. And remember that this random walk starts at the origin and it reaches a height of roughly square root of N after N steps. Um, so what we do is first, I've already done this, this random walk is initially only defined on the integers but we replace it by a P out by a piecewise linear function, just make it linear on the segments between integers. So first we make PL. So then we have X, um, we can define X of T, P and R. That's the first step. Now we have good continuous functions. And then the next step is we approximate grounding in motion in the following way. We take our function and we speed the time up by a factor of t, a factor of n rather. Uh, so at time one, we've actually gone n steps. But now our, our variance is uh, n, our standard deviation is square root of n. So we want to correct so that the variance at time one should be equal to one. So we divide here by square root of n. In other words, we scale by square root of n in the space direction, and we scale by n in the time direction. And this then gives a measure mu n on the space of continuous functions. And then we let mu be the limit of these measures mu n. And this is a theorem, a special case actually of a theorem to Chodonsker, which says mu n converged to mu this so-called Wiener measure for standard Brownian motion. So in fact, this construction works.
The second construction, uh, which uh, goes back to Paul maybe, is um, construct E of T. It's enough to figure out what gravity of motion is over a finite time interval. So let's do it for time goes from zero to one, then it extends in a simple way to the whole, all continuous functions uh, by uh, specifying its values recursively on finer and finer dyadic grids. And uh, we'll do this in detail. This is the main construction I'm going to focus on. But the idea is that we know at time one that B of one should be distributed according to a standard Gaussian of variance one. So we start our construction by just picking the value of B of one uniformly on the real line with respect to Gaussian measure. And then we approximate our function by drawing a straight line. Now we know this is wrong. So we go to the point of half and we have a function. The problem with this function is its variance is not a half like it should be. It's actually a quarter. So we add to it another function, a variance a quarter, another Gaussian to move it up or down. Maybe it will move it up. And now we have a better approximation to Brownian motion. But again, it's too deterministic at the midpoints of these edges. And so we budge it up there and there. And we keep going, and in the limit, we get, it turns out, a continuous function almost surely. And by construction, it satisfies all of the independence properties we would like at the dyadic uh, rationals in the interval. And then it's a straightforward exercise to show using continuity that that uh, allows the axioms to be verified for general time. Um, and then there's a third version of, about which I'll say almost nothing, just because we're short on time, which is we construct not, not Brownian motion, but we construct B prime of T. And this is something called white noise. And this is almost a random uh, vector in L2 of 0, 1. Unfortunately, it's not quite a random vector in this nice Hilbert space. Nevertheless, we can use this Hilbert space to define this guy as a distribution, and then we integrate uh, to get B. And this version is very nice because the, the construction can be done in a basis independent way. And it turns out if you choose different bases for L2, you get the same answer. And a very special basis reduces us to essentially Paul Levy's, uh construction. And uh, the other reason I like this is that this random uh, vector in L2 of 0, 1 can also be construction on the wings in the plane and it underlies the idea of the Gaussian free field. But unfortunately, we don't have much time to get into that <laughs> in the remaining moments of the course. Um, okay, so this is where we're headed. I want to describe the construction of Brownian motion and then finally we'll be able to revisit many constructions in complex analysis such as harmonic measure and the equilibrium measure, uh, and express them in terms of the behavior of Brownian motion. And this provides not only a new technical tool, but a very strong intuition about what, we, what complex analysts have actually been doing uh, for the past couple of decades. So it's part of the integration of random processes into partial differential equations, and especially into the cauchy riemann equations and the Laplacian. Um, Okay, so rather than just launching into a technical construction, I want to I want to make several remarks. So we have the continuous functions on the real line. And this we can think of as sitting 
in, in the space of all functions from the real line to itself. Some huge, awful chicken off space, topological product. Um, but the point I want to make is that on this space, we can project to various finite dimensional subspaces. Namely, if we're given a sequence of times, T1 up to TD, then we can map to RD. And that map explicitly just takes, let me call this pi, it takes our Brownian motion B of T to the sequence of values, B of T1 up to B of T. And now we have our Wiener measure that is supposed to exist on C of R to tell us what a random function is. And it will push forward to a measure on this finite dimensional space. And the remark I want to say is that our axioms tell us exactly what this measure is. Predict this measure on the nose. And the reason is that if we were to arrange that these coordinates are strictly increasing, then we could take the coordinates on RD and we could replace them by the coordinates x1, x2 minus x1, x2 xd minus xd minus 1. So we could look at the increments rather than, um, than the values. And what we would find is that the measure nu in these coordinates is just a product of Gaussians. Because this increment is independent of x1. x1 itself is Gaussian distributed with variance t1 and mean zero. Everything here has mean zero, and all of the coordinates are independent. So the axioms tell you that when you take this measure and you project it to a finite dimensional vector space, you know exactly what the measure is. Well, there's a basic theorem called the Kolmogorov consistency theorem, which says if you know that, you know the measure. The measure is uniquely determined once you know all of these projections. And as, that's exactly as you would expect. If you can compute the joint distribution of all of the possible samples of Brownian motion, then you know what Brownian motion is. And that's the essence of our construction, is to run this process backwards. We'll use these joint distributions to construct Brownian motion at finite values and then show in the end, it gives a measure not on just R and VR, but on the continuous functions. The second thing, my second remark, is here's one of the big differences between Brownian motion and a random walk. If you run a random walk for time n, you can never get farther than distance n from the origin. Suppose I look at, I take a very small epsilon and I look at the value of Brownian, Brownian motion at time epsilon. Here's the origin, plus or minus one. Suppose I take a very distant interval here. I can say, what is the probability that Brownian motion at time epsilon lies at this interval, say 10 to the eight, 10 to the eight plus one. So what is the probability that Brownian motion in time epsilon goes distance 10 to the 8? Well, the main thing is not that it's small, but that it's positive. So the probability B of epsilon is in AB is positive for all possible intervals A and B. So in other words, Brownian motion diffuses immediately and touches every point on the real axis in an arbitrarily small amount of time. And the reason for this is that the distribution is given by the Gaussian with variance epsilon. And although that Gaussian is highly concentrated near the origin, it does assign positive mass to every integral on the integer. So for example, if you're taking a Brownian path and you want it to stop when it hits the boundary of a region, it will hit the boundary of a region in time epsilon. <laughs> so you always will have to stop some of your Brownian paths 
with, with a very low probability, the value of B of epsilon can be huge. Um, and let me conclude with the, with the final remark. Um, I'll say it in two, two ways. One is that the map uh, f of t goes to um, one over lambda f of lambda squared t, say for lambda greater than zero, is measure the circuit on c of r common here. In other words, if you take Brownian motion and you speed the time up by a factor of lambda squared, what you'll get is no longer Brownian motion. You see, Brownian motion, when we started out with, it has the property that its variance, the expected value of B of T squared, is given by T. So if you speed it up, the expected value of this variable will be lambda squared T, not lambda. But of course, if you put a lambda inverse in front of here, then the expected value of the square will be compensated for by this lambda inverse. And so if you speed up Brownian motion in space and, uh, in time, and then, um, and then contract the space variable at the same time, the end result is, and I'm saying this very inform formally, it's equal to B of T. In other words, this random function has exactly the same distribution as this random function. So that's the one of the first beautiful symmetries hidden inside of Brownian motion that we don't see inside of random walk. And in some sense, the whole theme and the, the raison d'etre of Brownian motion is that it acquires, in an absolute sense, symmetries that are absent from random walk by virtue of it being confined to a grid. Okay, so please read the chapter on Brownian motion. Look at Dinkin and Yuskovich chapter two and uh, come to office hours and we'll continue lecture a week from today. Okay. <laughs>